Welcome to Blueprint IoT. Today we will take a quick look on the new Raspberry Pi 5. While we have a bunch of performance improvements, we also have a bunch of new connectors and external stuff we will take a look on first. While we kept the two USB 2.0 ports for a peripheral like a mouse and a keyboard, we also kept the two times USB 3.0 ports but those come now at a rate of 5 gigabits per second which will enable you to plug in external hard drives or SSDs to use your Pi as a media center faster than ever before or even booting the whole operating system right from a SSD drive instead of a SD card. Moving on we still have an Ethernet connector right here at the corner which is now accompanied by two camera or display ports. That's something which is really new because before we had also one camera port and one display port. Both have been those bigger connectors while we now have the high density or mini connectors. At least that's what Raspberry Pi calls them. So for all existing displays or Pi cameras you need to have an adapter cable which is already available so that shouldn't be a problem but we gain a lot of improvement here. Even though we cannot plug in more than before, we still have those two ports, we have a huge improvement because those are now camera and display ports. This means both can be used as camera or display port. Before you had to strictly stick to the display port to plug in a display and the camera port to plug in a camera. Meanwhile, both connectors have been exactly the same, so it was possible to mix it up and in case you plugged in the camera into the display port or vice versa, you had a high probability of destroying the whole port. So basically destroying your whole Raspberry Pi, which is quite expensive. So that's not just an improvement in having the possibility to add two cameras or two displays via those connectors. It's also an improvement in safety in using the Pi. Moving on with the HDMI connectors. Those are still micro HDMI but now supporting dual 4K at 60 FPS. Looking at the previous model, the Raspberry Pi 4, we had also two micro HDMI ports, but we had only the possibility to have one time 4K at 60 FPS or two times 4K at 30 FPS each. So basically you're doubling the overall FPS capacity for the Raspberry Pi. So we can have 120 in total instead of 60 in total as before, even though we are limited to 60 FPS for each port. Further down the line we have a USB-C port for power supply, same as the previous model, but now we're supporting just below 27 watt. Maybe supporting is not the correct phrase because the Raspberry Pi will consume up to 27 watt, which is quite frankly a lot of power. The previous model, the Raspberry Pi 4, had a default Raspberry Pi power supply supporting up to 3 amps, which will equal to 15 watts. So we are more or less doubling the peak power demand, which will cause a lot of problems for a lot of projects. Because first of all, you need a quite capable, quite high power power supply. And also if you want to integrate your Raspberry Pi into your own circuit, supplying it via your major power supply for your whole circuit, for your whole application, for your maybe dedicated device you, you're about to build, you now need to manage an even higher power. So just imagine a bunch of extra components like a pump, a light, or maybe a display. All you want to power via USB. It will be difficult to find a USB power supply that can supply such a high wattage. Of course, there are power supplies out there especially since USB-C came a standard for laptops and stuff like this. But those are all quite expensive and maybe not feasible for your project, especially when you're looking at a dedicated device, which you may want to have an internal power supply and not an external brick. Since this problem was already present with the Raspberry Pi 4, even though it was not so extensive, because the power demand of the Pi was only roughly half of what we are seeing now, it was already a problem for some projects. So check out our video about how to supply your circuit properly with power to gain the possibility to supply high wattage for USB, but also wattage for 3.3 volts and also voltage for high power demand devices like pumps and so on.
moving on with the power button. Something totally new, something desperately needed, never seen before at a Raspberry Pi. And it's just such a convenience to have this power button. You always had to unplug the cable at the Pi before or at the socket and now you can just press a button. This is definitely a huge gain in comfort, especially during development when you have to reboot a couple of times. It was super annoying to do this via the power plug or doing it within the operating system depending on what you're running on your Pi. It's just a huge pain reliever to have this button. But let's take a look on the SD card slot, which is still present, even though not visible on this picture. It is still micro SD card, but is now supporting the standard SDR104, which will support up to 104 megabit per second by default of the standard itself. So this is again a huge improvement because booting times for the operating system, installing the operating system, all this is depending on the speed of your SD card, but of course also depending on the interface towards the Pi to enable the, or to capitalize on this speed of your micro SD card. So as ever before, I would recommend highly to buy the fastest SD card you can get. It's also a gain in flashing your operating system on your SD card. In case you don't know what this is and how it works, check out the video we made about this before. But generally speaking, that's an improvement you will feel on your daily basis when you're using the Pi. It will just be all more fluent, more smooth. Another first for the Pi is this PCI Express slot. So here you can plug in any type of extensions. Of course, we're seeing the first default extensions by Raspberry Pi themselves, but I guess the aftermarket will come up with a lot of extension boards, capitalizing the PCI Express port here. Again, a huge improvement because before you had to use your 40 pin header to connect any kind of extension, blocking some of your pins, which you may need for other external periphery like sensors and stuff like this. So having the PCI Express port to use extension boards is definitely a gain and still keeping the flexibility of the 40 pin header. Talking about performance, we have a brand new chipset in the middle, which is now 2.5 gigahertz quad core 64 bit architecture system on a chip, which was before with the Raspberry Pi 4 only a 1.8 gigahertz processor. So here we have again a huge improvement on speed. Of course, not only about the frequency, but also about overall performance, which is of course one of the reasons why we have this huge increase in power demand. Coming back to the topic of performance and power demand, of course, this power demand of up to 27 watt is not always present, only in high load applications. Also for the Raspberry Pi 4, if you're interested, Check out our video about the power consumption of the Pi. We made some experiments to figure out what's the actual power consumption depending on what you're doing with your Pi. And you can normally see that the power consumption is way below those maximum power demand that Raspberry Pi is stating. Of course, all those improvements in the interfaces like PCI Express, higher SD card speed and so on and so on is not coming out of nowhere. Raspberry Pi introduced their own chipset for the first time, the RP1, which is enabling all those increased speeds and managing all those IO interfaces. Because all this higher performance and higher power demand will end up in heat at the end of the day, Raspberry Pi introduced a little additional connector here where we can connect our cooling which is also supplied by Raspberry Pi as a default part in case you order it separately, which is also a Raspberry Pi first to supply a dedicated cooling pad. It will work out of the box. It comes with some heat sinks attached. It comes with some gap pads to transmit all the heat from the chipsets towards the cooling pad. And we have some easy connectors where you can just click everything in basically, plug it into the cooling connector and you're good to go. So overall, I think that are a bunch of great updates, giving us more power, more convenience on a daily basis. But the question for me is, where is Raspberry Pi moving with these changes? Looking at the Raspberry Pi portfolio, we have, of course, a bit of a 
differentiation between Raspberry Pi and Arduino in general, but that's nothing I want to talk about right now. But I think there are two groups. One is the microcomputer, which the Raspberry Pi 4 was definitely a huge move into this computer area, into this like desktop use as a media center, as maybe also as a daily computer for desktop. At least that's something Raspberry Pi was starting to advertising a lot with the Raspberry Pi 4, especially with those two HDMI connectors to use two monitors and so on and so on. So this was definitely a move. I'm not speaking technology wise, if it's a microcontroller or a microcomputer, we made a video about this before. What's the difference? More talking about where you're focusing on. And I think this was definitely a move towards desktop computing as a focus. At the same time, they introduced the Raspberry Pi Pico. It was a couple of months later, which was a dedicated microcontroller moving away from the traditional microcomputer, which Raspberry Pi always was. So far, they created this kind of gap between microcontroller application and Raspberry Pi moving more into the desktop computing area. Of course, with the Raspberry Pi 5 now, I think it's a clear move into this desktop computing area with higher CPU speeds, with more ports, faster ports, more data speeds, and so on and so on, more power demand, moving certainly into the direction of desktop computing, which is of course great on one hand because it's a still a relatively cheap and power efficient desktop computer, but of course still offering those capabilities you know from Raspberry Pi with the 40 pin header and so on and so on, but also moving away a bit from this makerspace, from this focus on building applications, building automation, building IoT devices, and more focusing with all the resources the Raspberry Pi has on board on desktop computing. And of course, all those resources, higher chipsets and so on, you need to pay for at the end of the day. Something I really liked was the Raspberry Pi Zero, which is kind of in between desktop computing and microcontroller. It is technically a desktop computer, a full microcomputer, but at the same time it offers, because of the form factor mainly, all the capabilities of a microcontroller. Of course, not all the capabilities. We can discuss about this in the comments and we discussed this before, I think, but it was offering a HDMI, a mini HDMI, different to micro HDMI a connector for display. You could program it, you could code it on the device itself, but you still could connect a camera, for example, with a connector. You still could connect all those different sensors and stuff via the 40 pin con connector, which is still present on the Raspberry Pi 5. That's not what I'm saying. And also was offering those capabilities of a desktop device where you can just prototype on one device without connecting it every time to an external computer. So I think this Raspberry Pi Zero was something because of the form factor and of course also the price point, it came as a Wi-Fi version. So something you cannot take as granted, for example, with an Arduino. So this device was super great, I think. And it was last updated in 2021, by the way. So already a couple of years ago. So I really appreciate the improvements for the Raspberry Pi 5 and I will definitely get one, but I would really looking forward to an updated Raspberry Pi Zero because I think that was this unique combination of desktop computing and makerspace form factor and price, which was so unique about Raspberry Pi and appreciating those improvements, but of course a bit worrying about the increased price and so on. I think this is it for today. I would be super curious about your thoughts. What do you think about this new focus on desktop computing and those performance improvements? What are your use cases for the Raspberry Pi? I always wonder, are there really people out there using the Raspberry Pi as a daily desktop computer instead of a laptop, instead of a Windows or Mac device? So let me know in the comments. Would appreciate a good discussion there. Thanks for watching and see you next time.